those of you who come, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it's uh, sometimes we have faculty members, sometimes we have research folks. Occasionally, we actually have somebody from outside the business school, but inside the university. And today, we're delighted to have Omar, who's uh, related not only to the business school but works with the team staff there. And uh, look forward to your business. Great. Thanks a lot, Peter, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming down to the to the talk. And uh, well, I'm Omar, uh, I'm a research fellow at the Kaplan Complexity Center, and most of the work that I will show you today is joint work with my uh, collaborator, Eduardo Lopez, also from Kaplan. And uh, for those of you who want uh, to know ahead of time the structure of the talk, I'll be showing you some, um, some data, some new data that is available, administrative data from uh, a few governments. And, uh, and then from this data, we build new, a new theory of unemployment. And then. Uh, I will discuss some of the theoretical implications and show you some empirical results that derive from this theory. And then I'm going to talk about some of, the, some of the new directions that we're taking with this research agenda. And for those of you who want to know the punchline of the talk ahead of time, the main finding in, in general terms is that labor mobility follows a network structure in the economy. This network structure shapes the amount of unemployment that we observe in, in economies. And under certain circumstances, the, the network can contribute to most of the, of the level of unemployment that we see in the data. So everything that I will show you today is uh, data driven. That means that it all began by looking at uh, very fine details of, uh, of uh, high resolution data sets. And uh, I have always had an interest in data sets with such resolution. As a matter of fact, when I was doing my PhD, I was in a department of computational social science which interestingly was part of a college of neuroscience. So I, I came to interact a lot with, uh, with neuroscientists and I found amazing that two seemingly unrelated fields shared a lot of similarities in terms of how data sets evolved through time, uh, how different technologies contributed to the creation of new data sets and how new methods came to be to exploit the resolution of those data sets. So I want to begin by drawing some parallels between two seemingly unrelated disciplines, which would be the study of unemployment and uh, neuroimaging. So going back to their uh, uh, first beginnings, it turns, turns out that uh, neuroimaging uh, was started by uh, an Italian fellow called Angelo Mosso, who was interested in, in understanding how brain activity can be mapped. And the theory was that the more uh, brain activity you had, you would require more, blo more blood flowing in your brain. So a way to test it was to create this device that looks like a medieval torture uh, machine. What this is is basically you would lie down like this person here, and then you would calibrate the device to balance your body across the, the surface. This would be calibrated for every perturbance from your body, for example, your breath, the pulse of your arm, the pulse of your leg. So once everything is calibrated, anything else that is disturbing the balance has to do with the flow of blood in your brain. Then the person would give the subject some, uh, some task, like reading a book, and then you would, he would be able to trace the, the, movement, the, the movement of the balance uh, in order to, to infer that there is blood, blood uh, in the brain, so your brain is, is having certain level of activity. So for example, these are pencil traces of the, the breathing of the subject, this is the pulse of the arm, I believe. This is the pulse of the leg. And this is the remaining uh, movement of the machine. So to this point, the subject is doing nothing. Then the subject is given a task, and then you have these movements in the machine. This is pretty amazing. And, uh, and this, of course, is a very aggregate view of the problem. The researcher didn't know exactly what goes on the brain. He only knows that the brain just uses more blood. And in a similar way, around the same time, uh, in the study of unemployment, there was a, a very uh, aggregate uh, way to, to, uh, to count unemployment. Going back to the first census uh, in Europe, the first census in the UK is from 1850. And uh, what they would uh, do would be, would be very basic counting. So they would go house by house, right, asking uh, what is the name of the household, the head of the household, the wife, the children, and then they would write something about the occupation. And of, although this did not measure direct unemployment, it would give a first insight of, uh, of occupations across the population. It wasn't really until they started looking at administrative records in 1881 
that uh, the UK actually was reporting proper unemployment rates of the economy. And these records came from, the, from uh, records from labor unions. So they would ask how many people in the union is actually working. So both views, as you can see, are very aggregate. You count, you count a single number as a very general description of the problem. So after World War II, there were a lot of developments in both fields. So on one hand, you would have the PET scans developed in, in the 60s. The first machine was called the head shrinker developed in Massachusetts. And the PET scan, basically what it does is that you inject the subject with a chemical that has a particle that is atomic. This particle will release protons, uh, <coughs> and the positrons, sorry. And then the, posit the positrons would react with electrons in the environment. Then the PET scan would detect the trajectories of these electrons when they clash with the positrons. And then they would infer where are the, the, the electrons coming from, and they would be able to produce an image, kind of a cross-section of your brain, of the brain activity. In parallel, um, governments ha after the war, governments had a, a need to have a systematic uh, way of reporting unemployment. And they wanted to know more about uh, the people who is being unemployed, right? What are their professions? How long have, been the, have they been looking for a job? Um, where do they live? So this is when they started developing, developing the first labor force surveys, which are cross-sectional uh, data sets. Uh, this, of course, provided much more richer view of, of the problem, more uh, with high resolution. And a few decades later, we have even more resolution. It was not enough to have cross-sectional variation, but you also want to understand how this evolves through time. So in the case of neuroimaging, you have magnetic resonance technology, which uh, would allow you through the usage of magnetic fields to generate this very nice picture pictures about the brain, about how the blood moves uh, around the brain, so this maps into brain activity, and you can create now all these uh, high-resolution images. Similarly, uh, in, uh, in the study of unemployment, we have now the first data panels, which would get a cross-sectional uh, view of the problem and then track it through time. So some of the first ones, uh, the famous ones, and probably some of you have worked with this data panel, and this is from the US, is the the NLSY, they tracked uh, a cohort of, I think, 12,000 individuals in the US, which were between 14 and 22 years old in 1979. And, uh, and there are other revisions of this. They, they have created new panels for new cohorts. I think the next one is 1997. But this, of course, gave birth to a bunch of, uh, of methods of how do we analyze not only cross-sectionally, but temporarily. And many of these methods became part, uh, fundamental part of the curricula of, of uh, for example, of economics. You have textbooks and everyone uses the standard tools like uh, software uh, Stata. So what is the frontier today? <coughs> well, by talking to my peers in this college of neuroscience, I was pretty impressed about the kind of technology and data set that they were able to generate. So with functional magnetic uh, resonance, which is a refinement on the MRI and takes advantage of uh, hydrogen particles, because uh, atoms, because they are part of oxygen. And oxygen is transported by the blood. So it gives you so much more resolution when blood uh, is in the brain. So you can actually pin down exactly in what area of the brain in three dimensions you're having uh, most activity. This kind of data has, uh, has huge, huge uh, resolution and has given birth to a lot of big initiatives. Uh, that are trying to understand the problem of the brain at a much more deeper level. So one of them is the Human Brain Project, uh, which is uh, an initiative that was funded by the European Union. About They funded about 1.2 billion euros to generate a computational model that would be able to replicate all the detail that you would observe in the lab to understand how the neurons are connected and how this gives rise to cognitive states. Other uh, initiatives uh, in the US and uh, across other countries are also pretty, pretty big and they denote the, the evolution of methods together with the, with the data. In the study of unemployment, well, we do have a lot of data. We have had it since the 1980s through the digitalization of the public administration. So we have many uh, records from social security, from taxations that associate, connect people with companies, companies with companies. 
uh, and then they can be merged with demographic information, with financial information, et cetera. So we have very rich data, very high resolution. And what are the frontier methods that we are using today to exploit this data in the study of unemployment? Well, it's pretty much the same stuff that we have been using for the last 30 years. It's panel data analysis. There has not been a, a, a significant improvement in the, in the adoption of the methods that, that we use uh, to study unemployment. So uh, there is clearly a gap that, uh, that represents an opportunity in uh, improving our understanding of unemployment. And I want to show you very quickly uh, how does this kind of data look like. So some of you might know, uh, have seen this website. This was created by the New York Times after the, the recession. And what these guys are doing is they are picking uh, all the data on job creation and destruction of every industry in the US. Then they map the, the time series of job creation of each industry. What, <clears throat> what you have here is uh, independent time series. So if the, far mo the, the right far most are the, one, the industries with the highest uh, wages and the opposite of the left side. So you can actually explore these data sets by, let's say we can hover over here, internet publishing, broadcasting, and, uh, and see the, the dynamics of job creation throughout from 2004 to 2013. Similarly, you can look at those industries that have been declining where jobs have been destroyed. This gives you a more complete picture, of course, of what are uh, opportunities for developing uh, the economy, what are uh, the industries that might need to be protected. So although this is a very high resolution picture, it still lacks uh, important details uh, about uh, unemployment. For example, one might think that uh, Software publishers is a, is a sector that represents a big opportunity for creating more jobs, so you can incentivize even more the growth. Uh, but you don't know where actually these people, the people that is going to take those jobs are coming from. Are they coming from the industries that are declining, from securities and commodities, for computer and peripheral equipment? Probably, probably not. We don't know how these industries relate with each other, and we don't know the trajectories that people uh, follow uh, through this, uh, across these different industries. So how can we improve this? Well, <clears throat> first, I want to tell you that missing that kind of details can have important implications in the way we uh, forecast <coughs> and we measure aggregate variables such as unemployment. And let me give you a, an example. During the, the financial crisis, uh, the U.S. government was deciding to... Uh, to execute a package, to, to create a package, a stimulus package, that would create uh, a few millions of jobs. So they requested a, a, a study to two prominent economists, and, uh, and this is a report from that study. They created a model in which they estimated how much this package uh, would decrease unemployment during the crisis. So the idea is that the package was gonna create three to four million uh, jobs, it would be implemented through uh, cutting taxes, so incentivizing companies to uh, create jobs. And um, it would be focused especially into uh, certain sectors that they knew would suffer from the crisis, for example, the construction and manufacturing. Now, the kind of models that they use, although this is a policy paper and is very accessible, the kind of model behind it is not very far from the descriptions here so, well, you can see that the package is quite substantial in 700 billion. In the end, I think it was like 800 billion for six years, uh, approximately. And uh, so the kind of aggregate level in which, uh, at which these models look can be uh, seen in this phrase. So a conservative rule of thumb, that one percent increase in GDP corresponds to an increase in employment of approximately one million jobs, or about three quarters of a percent. So it's a very aggregate view, right? And, and believe me, the models that are behind this are not too far from, from this. You have these aggregate multipliers that are gonna give you some kind of relationship with another aggregate variable, and they are uh, leaving out all the structure that is uh, underneath the economy. So what happened with, the, with, the, with this report? What did they forecast? Well, they said that if the package was put in place, 
the maximum unemployment rate would reach less than 8%. And by 2014, it would settle down at this pretty low level and a very steady rate. If the package was not adopted, the unemployment rate was going to peak to 9%, but eventually in 2014 was going to also reach this uh, low level. So what was the real unemployment rate? This. So far more than the, act, than the worst case scenario of the model. But not only that, it really never settles to this level, at least not in the short run. And this is very important because you are missing uh, an important amount of time uh, in which your policy is going to affect a lot of people. So let me give you an idea, a more detailed idea of how exactly is that, that uh, economists conceptualize the dynamics of unemployment in this aggregate perspective. So uh, this is uh, uh, a caricature, of course, but it's pretty illustra illustrative of, of uh, the principles that under underlie most of these models. Mm. Think about all the unemployed people as this bucket full of marbles. We're going to call it you. Each marble is an unemployed person. Now we have a second bucket with all the employed people. We're going to call it L. Now this bucket uh, of employed people is dripping marbles. This is because there is a natural process in which jobs are destroyed. You know, firms die, firms are born. So uh, by this natural process, you get new unemployed people coming out of the pool of, of employed individuals. Now what you want to do is to take all the unemployed and just throw it into the pocket of, un of employed people. So if markets work, if markets are perfect, all these guys can fall here given that this is big enough to hold all the marbles, so there are enough jobs. So you can just throw them in. However, markets are, are not perfect. So we can introduce an obstacle in this process. So in this object, with this object we're gonna filter those marbles that go into the pool of employed people. So of course some will make it through by passing through the holes and some won't. Some will bounce around and then eventually fall out of the bucket of, of, uh, of employed individuals. This is what uh, labor uh, economists have uh, termed labor market frictions. So a friction in the labor market is uh, basically anything that prevents you from finding that job that is out there, perfect for you, and that if you don't fill it, it's gonna remain empty. And so if there is a friction, for example, you don't have the right social networks, so you never hear about the job, or you just live too far away, or you just didn't happen to read a newspaper advertisement that morning. Uh, <clears throat> all these are, are the, the kind of frictions that uh, prevent unemployed finding those jobs and allow for vacancies and unemployed people to coexist. So once uh, this process goes on, we have another bucket that gathers all those guys that did not find a job and those that lost their jobs. Finally, what you want to do is turn this again into our initial bucket of unemployed people and repeat the whole process again and again. And what you want to do then is to count on average how, much, how many unemployed people you have through time. And this can be described very easily through this equation. This equation is telling you the amount of unemployed people that you will have tomorrow is equal to the amount that you have today plus the, <coughs> the ones that are newly generated because they're losing their jobs. They are the ones dripping here. And those who are successfully finding jobs, so you're gonna subtract this from the, un, from the unemployment. Now what is M? M is a function. M is a function that takes two inputs. It takes the total number of unemployed people and the total number of vacancies. So here U is, let's say, the total number of marbles and V could be the size of the holes, how easy it is for the, hole to, for the marbles to go through and find the jobs. This is called the aggregate matching function, and this is the building block of most labor economics models. Of course, when you have a, such an aggregate function that only takes aggregate numbers, 
it ignores completely all the structure that goes on inside this, uh, this bucket of employed people. Who are the firms that are hiring? Where is, uh, where is people coming from? From which firms are moving to other firms? We don't know because this is just to aggregate. So we, uh, we started looking at some data to see if this aggregate view would reflect uh, some of the details that uh, are captured in, in, the, in the real world. So the kind of data that I'm talking about is, uh, comes from social security records. So many countries, European countries uh, and other countries, um, record every relationship between uh, our, an employee and their employer. So for example, if you were working uh, in 1989, and this is your ID and you're working in this company, the government is gonna write this relationship down. Why? Because you're going to pay something towards <coughs> your social security in taxes, and so your employer through their contribution. So we have this kind of data for, uh, for Finland, and the thing about Nordic countries is that everything is, is digitalized, everything is recorded. So we have it in uh, annual frequencies. So it's, a, it's an annual panel. And we have it for 20 years. And this covers the universe of workers and companies in Finland. So it's very comprehensive and it's very detailed. What we can do with this data is to look at how a person has been moving through different companies. So in this case, this worker moved from firm 531 to 4798. And we're gonna represent this as this relationship between these two firms. The next movement of this worker, you can track it down like this. Then the second worker is going to move to this firm. And we can keep doing this all over and add nodes to this structure, which is a network. So we can construct a network of labor flows. In this network, the companies are nodes and they are connected through the flows of people between them. When you do this for the entire economy, you have some interesting object. And this is the labor flow network for Finland. This is one year of flows. These are all the companies in the Finnish economy. And uh, the size of the nodes represents the, um, the number of, uh, of people that they receive and that they let go. So the larger there are, the more labor allocation are, they are involved in. In this layout, what you can see is that the, the layout clusters companies that share a lot of labor flows. So it's reveal, revealing you already a bit of, of structure in the economy. So you have clusters of companies where workers tend to, to move a lot. You also have in the periphery, all those little, little companies that are, have little to do with labor allocation. They're probably single uh, worker uh, enterprises uh, that are really disconnected from the, from the core of the economy. So what can we do with this, with this object? First, we can analyze it. We can get some statistics and, uh, and look at its general properties. So some of the things that we have found uh, are that the, um, there are a few firms that concentrate a disproportionate amount of labor flows. And uh, in, in other terms, that means that the, if you look at the distribution of connections of this network, it is not normal. It is far from normal. So you have very extreme values of concentration on the tail. So it follows actually a Pareto distribution. That's a very good approximation of, of the distribution of connections or the degree distribution. Something else is that when you observe people flowing between two firms, there were flows between those two firms in the past. There seems to be a, some persistence or reinforcement of the links that you observe in the network. It's not that a worker is just randomly going to jump to another company where no one has uh, transition before. At least you would not expect it in the data. And, uh, and many, these and other features are, uh, are very robust across different countries. We also got data for Mexico uh, and we see the very similar uh, properties. And, um, <clears throat> and they are also robust across different time frames. 
And this is just an example of the, the distribution of, of the degrees that I was telling you about. So this is uh, the distribution of all the inflows and outflows of companies and how frequently you would observe them in the data. So you can see that there are very extreme values. So there are companies that concentrate a lot of flows, a disproportionate amount of flows. So the next question then is, the model that I showed you in the beginning, does that explain this structure? How can we do that? How can we test that? So we developed a, a simple uh, statistical test to, uh, uh, <clears throat> to revise that, that hypothesis. The, the question is, okay, the conventional model, can it explain the amount of, of flows that you observe between pairs of companies? So the tool that we use to construct this, this test is based on a model that has been around for a while in, uh, in the network science uh, literature. This is called the configuration model, and it's a model of network formation. It turns out that this model has a direct correspondence with the model that I showed you about marbles randomly finding their way through a pool. And uh, the idea here, I'm gonna give you the, in, the, the, the intuition behind this test. Suppose that you have data about these flows of labor. So in the data, you have that firm I uh, send two workers to other two companies. And we're gonna denote those two workers with these arrows, so they are outgoing workers. This firm also received two workers from other companies. So we're going to assume that these are vacancies. They were vacancies and they were filled by the workers. The same with firm J. Now the question is, if we were to match the outgoing workers with the vacancies of other companies at random, <coughs> so you would grab this worker and say, find a vacancy, pick one at random, you, then if you would do this process over and over for every uh, outgoing worker, you eventually would, will have that firms connect and you create a labor flow network. So in this case, for example, for a random realization, you would have that this outgoing worker from J connected to I, and this from I connected to J, and the others connected somewhere else, probably. And the question is, if this happens at random, what is the expected amount of connections between two companies? Well, the building block for measuring this is actually very intuitive. The probability of observing K connections from I to J follows a binomial distribution. A binomial distribution where the number of attempts is the number of outgoing workers of I, which is K sub I, and the probability of success of each trial is just the number of vacancies held by firm J as a proportion of all the vacancies in the economy. So this is a building block. Using this, you can construct the proper test to know what is expected amount of flows between two companies. So we used that test with the data sets that we had. And we looked at the flows of every firm, that, between every pair of firms that we had in the data. And we said, okay, if the observed number of flows between firms is more than what we would expect on the, under this model, then that link is significant. That means that it is not explained by the classic model that I presented you previously. So we did this for our 20 years of data, and we just counted the number of significant links. And these are the results. So pretty much most of the firm-to-firm -firm flows cannot be explained by the traditional model. And if you think about it, this is not, this is not too surprising because if you are trying to account for the probability that one person finds a job in a specific vacancy, that is very, very small probability. So chances are that it's not, when you see it happening in the data, it's not going to be explained by the model. However, <coughs> this model can be generalized. So instead of, of having uh, the vacancies of one firm only here, you can have the vacancies of an entire industry, of an entire sector or a city. So we have data actually on the <coughs> industries to which companies belong and also on their geography. So you can divide economies of market. And the test now is, would you expect to observe the amount of, of labor flows from a single firm to the entire industry? 
And the answer is pretty much no. This fails as well for different levels of aggregation. No, doesn't matter how you cluster the, the economy into sub-markets. Most of the times, most of the firm-to-firm -firm flows are not explained by the classical model. So this is telling us that perhaps the aggregate view that we have of, of, the, of unemployment lacks some structure to it if we want to, to explain this, this phenomenon. And, and we want to account for that. So I'm going to present you um, a simple model that accounts for this structure. So in this model, suppose that you have N companies, a population of N companies and, uh, and H workers. Now, uh, every firm will be connected through a network. In the, this network means that uh, if two firms are connected to each other, the labor market frictions are quite low between them. So you would expect to observe workers finding a job in the neighboring firm of a, of a company. So neighboring means that they are connected. <clears throat> so uh, the workers, they can be either employed or unemployed. If you are an unemployed uh, worker, you might lose your job in a given period with a probability that is constant. We're going to denote it by lambda. We call this the separation rate. And this has to do with the with the dripping of the marbles that I was showing you in the first picture. This is a natural process of job, dis job destruction. If you are unemployed, what you will do is you're gonna pick one firm at random and submit a job application. Now the trick here is from where am I going to pick the firm? If we were in the aggregate model, well, you don't, you don't care from where. You pick any firm in the economy. But here, we're gonna take into account the network. So the job seeker is going to look at only those firms that are connected to his or her last employer. And from that sample space, which I denote by gamma sub i, it's going to pick one firm and submit an application. So once the application is submitted, the firm will decide to hire the applicant with a certain probability, denoted by h. And I'm gonna call this the hiring policy. So this is a measurement of, uh, for example, how intensely the, the firms are hiring. So we are interested in measuring aggregate unemployment from this model. So let me draw two connections between this model and the classical model. The first one is that if the network was a complete graph, that means that every node would be connected to any other node, to every other node, this model is equivalent <coughs> to the one of the buckets of employed and unemployed people. So we're gonna call that model the global search model because workers can search anywhere because firms are connected to every other firm. A second connection is that even if the network is not fully connected, if you have that all the firms have the same hiring policy, then the aggregate unemployment is going to be the same as a classical model. And I will uh, give you the intuition uh, in a second. Let's start by looking at the classical model. This is a question that I showed you before. Unemployment tomorrow equals employment today, plus the new unemployed. And now we don't have the aggregate matching function. Now we have the specific probability of unemployed people finding jobs. And because here, a job seeker can sample any firm in the economy, the probability of finding a job is just the average of all the hiring policies in the economy. So we're interested in getting the aggregate unemployment rate, which is just the total unemployment divided by the population size. Sure. Are the agents homogeneous? Are they assumed to be homogeneous? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So this is what you get out of this. This is a very classic equation. It's a textbook equation in labor economics. It is also called, uh, it's an approximation to some, uh, an empirical regularity called the beverage cure, which is a negative relationship between the unemployment rate and the number of vacancies in the economy. Of course, a proxy for the number of vacancies in the economy here would be the average hiring rate or hiring policy. Now, how does our model look? Well, 
The equation looks very similar with the difference that now you have to do it at the level of the firm. So the number of unemployed people in firm I tomorrow is given by the number of unemployed people at that firm today plus the ones that were separated from that company plus the one, minus the ones that successfully find that job. Now the average hiring rate is the average only of the neighbors of company I. So this is determined by the network. But what is the number of unemployed associated to a firm? So this is a new concept. And uh, we call this firm-specific unemployment. Think uh, of this about like uh, when you become unemployed <coughs> and, and you're still searching for a job, you are kind of associated to your last employer. So we're going to, if, if we count all the people in your situation whose last employer was firm I, then the firm-specific unemployment of firm I are all those people. This has never been measured. And uh, I'll show you some uh, empirical results uh, in a bit about this. So when we solve for this, we're interested again in getting the unemployment rate. So now you have to add up all these firm specific unemployment, all firm specific unemployments across the economy, divided by the population size. But we don't know this. We don't know what is you. Well, we can actually solve the model and uh, get this identity. The firm specific unemployment is equal to a constant that is a normalizing constant, don't worry about it. And it's proportional to the hiring policy of the firm. This is very intuitive because if you are hiring more people, you are larger. And by the natural process of separation, you're going to lay off more people as well. So you're gonna have more unemployed people around you. And it's also linearly uh, related to the to the degree of the company, so to the number of connections, which makes sense as well, because you have more connections, you have more applicants coming to you. So when we uh, plug this in, uh, in the model, this is the unemployment rate that we get. It looks a bit messy at a first uh, look, but uh, if we look carefully, we can draw the connection to the classical model. We have the lambda here, lambda again, and the average hiring policy but this is at the level of the, of the company. If all companies have the same hiring policy, then this is equal to the one of the, the average hiring policy of the entire economy. And since in that case, this doesn't depend on the, on the firm anymore. So these two sums cancel out and you end up with the equation of the classical model. This means that um, the classical model is a special case of this model in which you have a particular distribution of hiring policies and a particular network structure. So how does this uh, affect, how does this uh, distribution of the hiring policies affect the unemployment rate? Mm. And more importantly, if this model generates, has this connection to the aggregate one, wouldn't it'd be simpler just to assume that the hiring policies are homogeneous and just work with the aggregate model. It's easier, it's simpler. Well, let's see what, are the, what is the price of doing that. So let's think about a set of hiring policies, one for each company. And you're gonna create that set from, uh, from uh, taking values between zero and one. And the only requirement that I'm going to put in this example is that the average hiring policy is going to be 0 0.5. The next step is to take a network. And in this case, we're going to assign a hiring policy to each node, and the hiring policy is going to be 0.5. So here, there is no heterogeneity in hiring policies. Now, we want to compute the, the, the formulas that I showed you to calculate the unemployment rate. So I chose a, a set of parameters that will give me an unemployment rate of 0 0.4. And we're going to do that on a network with a regular structure. This means that all the firms have the same number of connections. They are randomly connected, but it's always the same number of connections. So what if now we have heterogeneous hiring policies instead of homogeneous of 0.5? These heterogeneous policies on average give you 0.5, but they are all different. And we are going to assign them at random. <coughs> One for each firm, you don't care who gets what hiring policy. And we compute the, 
the, the equation. Well, it turns out that you get the same ag aggregate unemployment rate. It makes sense because if you are assigning these hiring policies at random, that means that the sample space for an individual, which is the sample given by the neighbors of their workers, of their firm, is representative of the entire population. And well, when you look at this, then you can say, well, then why do we care about heterogeneity? You just assume that they are homogeneous and we get the same result again. And we just work with a simpler model. Okay, but what if you have actually a different way of assigning the hiring policies? Take a node at random and give it the highest hiring policy, one or almost one. Then take a neighbor and give it the second highest. Take another neighbor, give the third highest. Take the neighbors of the neighbors and give the next highest and keep going all the way until you reach the peripheral nodes, which are the furthest away from your initial node. And those guys are gonna have the lowest hiring policies. So what you have here is that unemployment now drops. We have the same average hiring policy. We have the same network, just the way we are assigning it to the companies. Why does this happen when well, we can look at the, at the equation of unemployment. This helps to understand. What happens is that you have the, the firms with the highest hiring policy are the largest ones. All firms have the same degree, so there is no effect here that differentiates companies. So you have the largest firms with highest hiring policies. When a person gets out of these companies and they go out looking for a job, they're going to be sampling companies that also have high hiring policies. So they will have good employment prospects. Overall, you will have a, high, a larger population of individuals that are sampling companies with high hiring policies and a smaller number of people sampling companies with poor employment prospects. And that's why your unemployment rate drops. What, yes? Is there a reason why you have heterogeneity on hiring policies and not the agents themselves? It seems like the agents themselves that are selected into these are heterogeneous, and the ones that end up in these larger companies, there's some human capital associated with it. Yes, uh, so I will touch uh, on okay. that as I get to a more elaborate model, but okay. thanks for the comment. Uh, and, uh, and if I don't answer, uh, then we can okay. get back to it. <coughs> but um, so, so far, this is very, very simple model, right? It's like a stochastic process, basically. And uh, <clears throat> so what if you have the opposite? You assign, actually, you take a note, assign the lowest hiring policy, then go all the way out un until you reach the, the furthest away ones and assign, give them the highest ones. Well, you have the same effect. And the reason has to do with the structure of the network. Because remember, K is not inducing any effect. So you will always end up with two camps, one, with high hiring policies and one with low hiring policies, and both will be connected to similar, to similar companies. So this is with a regular network, but we already know that the labor flow networks is not regular. There are companies that concentrate a lot of flows. So what happens if we do this, the same exercise, but with a realistic topology? It has the same number of connections, but we're just going to rewire them. So here, you get the same result again. And this is again because the hiring policies are not correlated with anything. So local sample is representative of the entire economy. But what, what happens here? So um, raise your hand if you think that unemployment rate is gonna be higher, okay? Who thinks that unemployment rate is gonna be lower here? No, no guess? Unemployment rate's the same? No one, don't be afraid. <laughs> okay. So you get also that it goes down. And the logic is, is pretty similar. Now what happens here? Give me your guess. So who thinks unemployment is gonna go up? It's gonna be higher. Nobody? One? <laughs> who thinks it's gonna go down here, it's not gonna be the same, I'm telling you that, okay? So it goes up. Why does it go up? Well, think about the sampling process and the network structure. If you grab a node at random 
in these kind of networks, chances are that company is going to be connected to one of the hubs, to one of the companies that concentrate connections. So if you're giving the lowest hiring policy to that node, then you're gonna give giving pretty much also the lowest hiring policies to the hubs. So now we have an effect also on the connections. It happens that the hubs are also the largest companies because they have a humongous K. They have a huge amount of, of connections. So you have that the largest companies have the lowest hiring policies. So they have more people, they lay off more people, and these people are going to be sampling firms that are hiring very few applicants. So this, in, this becomes the opposite prediction. It's not only a bias, but it's just the opposite prediction. Now, the question is which case is the one that matters? Because right now we have been just assigning these hiring policies by hand. So to answer this, we need to introduce some social mechanisms here. So we need some social theory. So I'm going to uh, extend this model and introduce some economics. What I want to do now is to generate the hiring policies from firm behavior. So this is a very simple model of firm behavior in which the hiring policy represents the expectation of the firm about the, the, the job market. So imagine that uh, workers go uh, uh, walk in the street, they see a company, and they decide to drop their CV which is an application, only one every day. So firms gather CVs through time, and then they build an expectation, on, okay, on average we get actually uh, five applicants uh, every day, or three applicants every day. So when it comes to open a vacancy, they already have an idea of how many, vac how many uh, applicants they will have. So of course, they're not gonna open more vacancies than the applications that they would receive. It would be a waste of resources. You don't want to have empty vacancies. So they will open at most the number, the expected number. And uh, if it's too costly to open the vacancies, you might open less. So in, in the end, we're gonna represent again this with our hiring policy H, which is a fraction of the applicants uh, that the firms have. Now, there is a cost involved in setting this uh, hiring policy, and we're going to represent it with a parameter of cost, C. And we're gonna assume as well that, uh, that the costs are proportional to the sizes of the companies because larger firms tend to invest more per worker in recruiting, in, uh, in filtering process, et cetera. And we're going to assume that there is a market wage. It's only one wage, it's unique, it's given by the market at this point, and they have to pay that wage. So this, the expected production of a company is the amount of, uh, is the labor that they have plus the people that they hire the people that stays in the company, and the productivity parameter, which we call Y. This is a constant, so don't worry too much about it. The problem of the firm then is to maximize profits, choosing an optimal hiring policy, which is given by this equation. This also intuitive is uh, the amount of people that you have left, the profit that you get from it, which is productivity, minus the salary. The same for the new guys that you're hiring, minus the cost. In order to solve this, we need to know what is the size of the firm and the, and the number of applications. So in a typical economic model where you assume rational actors, we're going to assume that the firms are really very, very rational. So they actually understand how the entire system is interconnected, so they are able to estimate these equations. So for example, they know this equation, which is a solution to the model. It's telling us that the size of the company is proportional to the hiring policy, logic, logical, and also to the hiring policy of the neighbors. Why? Because if the neighbors are hiring more, they are bigger, they are laying off more people, and that people eventually will become potential applicants to me, and to the degree. They also know this equation for the number of applications that we receive. And when you incorporate this into the problem, the solution here is that the optimal hiring policy of the firm is this very simple equation. The important thing here is that the equation does not depend on I on the sub-index. So all firms have the same hiring policy, which is a first approximation. The advantage of this approximation is that we can use it to test the theory with empirical data. How? We can take our equation 
on the firm size and plug back the hiring policy. And you can collapse all these parameters into this one. We have the data on the networks of flows from Finland. We also have the data on their sizes from a different data sets. So we can just test this hypothesis through a simple linear regression and estimate the parameter beta. And when you do that, you of course get the, a nice uh, positive relationship between the size of the company and the number of connections. You can do the same with data about the profits. We also have data of the profits, so we can collapse parameters in this coefficient, estimate it, and get that the hypothesis uh, <clears throat> of, a, of a zero relationship is rejected. And I can show you tables with many stars and everything, but uh, that's kind of boring, so I prefer pretty pictures. And, uh, and this is very robust across the 20 cross sections, and also when you do it for Mexico. So, I don't want you to read this as this is the full story of what determines firm sizes. Of course, there are many other things that have to do with the strategies and, and other uh, productivities, etc. This should be read as a sanity check, that the theory is actually producing something roughly consistent with the data. Now, I want to move to something more interesting, which is when firms don't have a homogeneous hiring policy. To do this, we need to introduce another mechanism that allows for heterogeneity. <coughs> We're gonna do it by endogenizing the wages. So first I want you to notice that the demand of labor of a company is simply the people that they hire every period, which is the number of applicants times the fraction that they hire, which is the hiring policy. And I'm going to assume uh, a functional form for a labor supply, which uh, for convenience, I'm choosing this one. Uh, it is asymptotic in the, in the productivity which means that firms are not willing to pay more than what they are getting out of the worker. And, uh, and we have this parameter as well, this uh, B, which uh, determines the elasticity of the supply. So it plays with the slope of the supply. Now, when you introduce this mechanism, now the optimal hiring policy of the company is different. It's heterogeneous, and it's actually very intuitive. So it is either that the firm hires everyone, so that's a corner solution, or it hires a fraction between zero and one. The difference now is that this fraction depends on the hiring policy of the neighbors. So firms have to take into account what the other, their neighboring companies are doing to, get, to form an expectation of how many applicants they will get. Of course, now when you have for hundreds of thousands or millions of companies, you have to solve the system of equations. Well, don't worry too much. It's, it's quite simple, actually. It has some nice properties that allow us to solve it. And, uh, <clears throat> and we can do it for the data. Before going to the data, I want to show you some theoretical implications of this uh, model. So let's look at, at a network that is rewired in three, three different ways. The first one is the regular graph. So then everyone has a connection. K, uh, so the degree distribution follows a delta distribution. The other is the realistic one, the Pareto, right? So you have very extreme concentrations of connections. And let's pick an intermediate case, which is the binomial distribution. It's like a Gaussian. Uh, you don't have very extreme values in the tails. And normally, this is approximated to homogeneous values in, in economics, they, because there is very little heterogeneity. So, what I will do now is I'm going to fit the, I'm going to compute the, the unemployment rate for the model, um, given a, a certain uh, set of parameters. And I'm going to, to compute the average hiring policy that we get out of solving this system. This is the average hiring policy. Draw up a dot to the corresponding unemployment rate that we get. Then I'm going to change the parameter of C, which is the cost, how expensive it is to increase the hiring policy. So I'm going to, uh, to make it smaller. When I make it smaller, that means it's cheaper to have high hiring policies. So everyone increases the hiring policy. So the average hiring policy goes up and unemployment goes down. So you do this for different levels of, of the cost parameter. 
and you can draw this nice line. This is the beverage curve, the curve that I showed you in the beginning in the form of a formula. Now this is for the network in which everyone has the same number of connections. Now let's change the, connect, the, the topology to the one in which you have some heterogeneity. And you have, that, you have slightly more unemployment than in the other one. But when you use the realistic one, it's not a slight increase. It's not a, it's not a slight increase. It's actually a significant one. In this case, like 2% difference in the unemployment rate. <coughs> and this is only because of the structure of the network. Nothing else changed. We didn't change parameters uh, related to the costs or the number of companies, etc. Another uh, implication is that the hiring policy of each company follows a correlation to the hiring policy of the neighbors, which was intuited by the formula. Of course, for the case of homogeneous hiring policy, well, you cannot see that because there is no heterogeneity. For the binomial case, you do have this correlation. And the correlation is sharper when you have the realistic structure. Now, what is the direction of this correlation? It's a negative correlation. It's a negative correlation in which the firms with the highest connectivity are the ones that are going to set the lowest hiring policies because they get more applicants, so they don't need to have a very high age. Hence, their neighbors are going to have also low hiring policies. And this is the case of the counterintuitive result that I showed you earlier, in which you have a negative correlation of the assignments of the hiring policy. So <coughs> economically speaking, theoretically speaking, that is the assignment that makes sense, the one that was the most interesting. And this comes up from a model where firms uh, interact uh, indirectly through the, through the network. So we can take this and use our data uh, to understand what are the implications of the structure of the network in the real world. So what I will show you here is the annual unemployment rate in Finland from 1988 to 2007. They had a terrible crisis in the early 90s. Some people here might know better than me. Um, <clears throat> so what I will do now is I'm going to fit the model to each one of these annual uh, observations. That means that I will take the labor flow network from the data from each year, and I'm going to, to tune the parameters to match the observed unemployment rate level. Then I'm going to, to perform a counterfactual, which is keeping the same parameters, which means keeping the same economic conditions, <coughs> I am going to only rewire the structure of the network. So instead of having the one from the data, I'm just going to generate a regular graph where everything is flat because of the structure that is connected to the classical model, right? So when we do that, we recompute the solution and the unemployment rate, and you get that it drops. It drops an amount for a certain supply elasticity. And it turns out that the elasticity plays a crucial role here. The more inelastic the, the supply is, it allows for more dispersion of salaries, which translate into costs for the companies. So you have more variation in hiring policies. So for another elasticity, the influence of the network topology is even larger. And you can keep going and get attribute all the influence to the network. Now, these peaks have to do with an anomaly in the data. There was a year in which uh, there were too many firms with one connection. So you can see that it kills not only the level of unemployment, but also the, the variation through time, because it's not that they are going down uh, proportionally year by year. And uh, this is a very interesting result, because it is telling you that given the same economic conditions, it's only how firms our structure in the economy, how the labor market and, their fric and its frictions are structured that can generate all these huge differences in aggregate uh, unemployment. However, I'm not a fan of equilibrium because with equilibrium we're missing some of the most interesting aspects of this kind of model, a model in which you have a defined structure of interactions between companies. Uh, <clears throat> 
a part of, of this structure can give, can give us important hints about the propagation of local shocks, for example, in the labor market. How if a firm changes its behavior, that affects the flows of labor to its neighbors, and then they adapt their behavior, and this propagates eventually. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to introduce an adaptive model, which is a refinement of the model that I showed you. The only difference here is that the companies don't know the formulas for L and A for applications and the sizes. Instead, they're going to, to learn them through time. They're going to experience, hire people, and learn on average, I have this size, and they're going to estimate that. Now, the, of course, this process is going to be affected by the neighbors, because everything is interconnected. And <coughs> the, um, what I will use here uh, is, uh, is another method, which is agent computing. And agent computing is, is basically a computational simulation in which each company is a piece of software. Each worker is a piece of software. And the model that I show you, I'm just going to let run that process. I'm going to let workers go lose their job, apply to, to a firm, let the firm decide to hire or not with a probability. And, uh, and with that kind of simulation, I'm going to show you a fine-grained picture of the dynamics of unemployment when we introduce shocks. Now I'm going to do an experiment with what I call homologous shocks. That means that I will introduce shocks to two different parameters independently. They are different experiments. One is the separation rate. Remember, this is the probability of losing your job. And the other is the cost of the hiring policy. And I will choose the level of modifying those parameters such that in both cases, it gives me the same unemployment rate in the end. So this is, in the horizontal axis, you have time. This is unemployment rate. And this is a mathematical solution. This is the, the equilibrium model. You have that through time. The unemployment rate is, is this. Then you introduce a change. And firms already know what is going to be the outcome. So they, they immediately choose their optimal hiring policies. So the adjustment is instantaneous. And then you have the, the new level of unemployment. <coughs> I'm going to let the computer run, each firm independently. And I am going to run a census on the population of firms and count how many unemployed people are associated to the firms and compute the aggregate unemployment. So these are the dynamics that you observe, which is pretty much what you observe in real data, right? Looks like the data from Finland that I just showed you. So you have that introduce the shock, and you have an overshoot from your prediction. Eventually, it settles down. Now, this parameter, which should yield the same amount, gives us a qualitative, qualitatively different picture. There is also an overshoot, but the time it takes to settle down to the final employment rate that is predicted by the rational equilibrium model is much more larger. And Another advantage of this, this type of tools is that we can actually track down the individual evolution of each company. So we can track the trajectory of the, the firm specific unemployment rates, understand this better. So each one of these black lines is the unemployment, the firm specific unemployment rate of each company. And just by the, by the color of the overlapping of these lines, it means that because you're changing the rate at which people is separated, you have a higher turnover overall in the economy. So you have more fluctuations uh, after the shock, which is very different from this other mechanism of trans transmission, which is a cost to the firms. You're not changing the turnover. So <clears throat> overall, this looks more, 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 much more steady. But it's more interesting when we actually follow the trajectory of the firm's behaviors. So it's, that is, uh, let's look at the, the, how they determine the age through time, the hiring policies. And you can see that the picture is completely different. On one hand, you have that when you affect a parameter that is directly involved in the cost of the company, that's something observed by the firm. So firms react immediately. They drop their hiring policies because it became more expensive to hire people. This kills the heterogeneity and eventually settles down again. It grows again and settles down. In the case of the hiring policy in the presence of a shock to the separation rate, remember, if you noticed, the solution to the optimal hiring policy of the firms does not consider this parameter. 
So it's nothing directly observed by the companies. It is something learned by experiencing fluctuations on the number of applications that they receive. So you see that there's a gradual process of, of the firms in understanding that now the things have changed in the labor market, so they need to readjust their hiring policies, overshoots again, and eventually settles down. And finally, I want you to, to look at this. Even when the, when the system settled down, so on average, to the unemployment rate, when you look at individual trajectories, there is a wide diversity of, of uh, trajectories. Some go really, really high, then go low, then go up. These are not equilibrium strategies. These are, this is not equilibrium behavior. These are not firms that uh, foresee the outcome of the shock and stick to a single strategy and never move out of that. These are firms that are learning from local interactions. And this is very valuable when we think in terms of policy. We want to understand where to place policy, how are firms going to react, and how is this going to propagate into the aggregate observations. And <clears throat> this tool can be made uh, very friendly. And uh, so as an example, we have developed uh, uh, an online application that uh, anyone can use to, to understand a little bit more about these dynamics. This was developed actually with the, with the support of the Site Foundation. And uh, what this is, 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 a, is a computational model. It's, it's pretty much the same model on this, on this side. You have the, the network, the labor flow network. The nodes can be firms or it can be industries if you want. Then you have a dashboard with uh, some parameters that you can manipulate and uh, the aggregate uh, variables of interest. So we can hit play. And now we have that the workers are flowing through the network. They are losing their jobs. They are finding new jobs. You have the unemployment rate evolving, nearly 10%. So this firm seems quite central. And uh, let's assume that this firm uh, is going to uh, stop hiring people at, uh, <coughs> with such frequency. So we drop its hiring policy. And now you can see all the workers flow somewhere else. But obviously, the contribution of a single firm is not enough to, to observe in the aggregate. But you can also do the same for uh, a bunch of firms with an entire cluster, an industry, and then drop their hiring policies. And now you can see in real time how they contribute to the aggregate unemployment. And um, well, this is just one example of the many models that we have developed of this kind. Uh, this is uh, in beta version, and uh, we will soon release a more complete one with uh, economic variables and salaries and consumption. But uh, so finally, with this overview, I want to summarize uh, my talk. Uh, it's telling you again that uh, there are new ways to, to use very good data that is out there, that has been out there for a while. And, that can, and these ways can inform the way we understand unemployment. Um, the classic approach that dominates today and that most policymakers use leaves out a lot of structure that is very important, especially for policy. Uh, and ignoring this structure may lead no, not only to biases, but to erroneous predictions. And, um, it, it turns out, actually, that uh, many behaviors uh, of, of firms and uh, eventually workers as well, they correlate through these structures. And in many ways, they can amplify or mitigate the effects that we would expect in, uh, in, um, in perturbation, of perturbations of the labor market. We can use the technology for, uh, from agent uh, computing models, for example, to create more realistic models where you have adapt adaptive uh, behavior. And, uh, and overall, this, um, this is a new way to study a broader class of problems. Uh, in the labor markets. For example, the, the propagation of shocks, the try to identify, to estimate where do we have informal labor as well. That's a project that, that we're proposing. Um, how how do, to better design policy interventions, et cetera. And uh, finally, I just want to tell you that uh, it doesn't really matter if you have uh, neurotransmitters or blood or workers flowing through a network. If you have the data, you have the resolution, you should be using the best available methods that you can. It is only then that we will be able to have a significant breakthrough in our understanding of unemployment, just as the ones that have been done in other disciplines. Thank you.